Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Talking Points with Matt and Matt. Um, we for about two weeks, for various reasons, we had to take a break, but we're we're going to get back into the swing of things. And today, we wanted to just give a kind of a brief overview of um, of uh, where politics is going right now. Of course, we recently just. Um, uh, well, it keeps dragging on and on, but but you know the the, the presidential election happened very recently. Um, there's been a lot of um, a lot of talk about it because um, it's actually been a pretty um, interesting election. Um, in some ways, the the mainstream uh, predictions or interpretations, you could say maybe they were vindicated at some level. In other ways, they were completely or they were um, contradicted. Um, Matt and I were having a conversation over text uh, a week or so ago about the whole thing, um, and, and we just wanted to wanted to explore um, sort of what what we think is going to happen in the next two to four years. You know, what do we expect from a Biden presidency? Um, are we optimistic? Are we pessimistic? Um, so I, I was just going to kind of start with a few thoughts I had, and then Matt can riff off of those, and, and we'll go from there. Um, the my general prediction, um, and I don't have, I didn't have like any special knowledge. I, I was just re I was reasoning from a few um, bits of intuition and, and and pieces of information that I had. But I was reasoning that um, Joe Biden was going to win the president's er, win the election, and I reason that because um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're in the middle of a great recession. Um, whether you Agree or disagree, a lot of people are very unhappy, very upset, very um, confused. And what happens often is if there's crazy events going on under the watch of a particular president, generally that president gets blamed. So I figured that would be um, part of it. Um, a few weeks before the election, Biden was up like 16 percentage points in the polls. Now, the polls, we'll, we'll get into um, that in more detail, of course, but I thought I thought that was a good good lead. Um, and then uh, another aspect, of course, was um, the the question of like uh, how someone votes based on their politics, basically. Um, and so th th there's some evidence that um, uh, if you're more left leaning, more Democrat, you're more likely to you were more likely to vote by mail. And if you were a Republican, you were more likely to vote in person. Um, so someone, I don't know who came up with this term, but there was a term, the red mirage, the idea that on election day, it would look like Trump was winning because all the, all the in-person ballots were being counted. And then as the mail-in ballots um, trickled in, it would uh, show that, in fact, um, Joe Biden uh, was in the lead. N none of this is controversial. Most of this is, is mainstream um, analysis, some of which I agree with, some of which I disagree with. Um, but I, I think that's a good... Uh, introduction to, to the topic. Um, so I will let uh, my co-host jump in here. Yeah, I thought it was going to be an interesting election. So so to, 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 to give some inside baseball, um, off air a, a month or two ago, we, 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 we wagered a little bit on the election. I don't remember if the odds were what, for where Trump, it was a one to four or one to five Trump Biden, but I know I lost $10 assuming Trump doesn't prove some miraculous, you know, um, he pulls like a, a million votes across several states. Um, but the way I saw it was a lot of people were giving Trump very, very low odds. And I was thinking, well, I don't think he'll win, but I'd happily take one to four odds. I thought there was probably close to like a 40 or 50 percent chance he'd win. Um, and I listened to a lot of 538 um, podcasts. That's like with Nate Silver and all of them doing election analytics. And they've kind of debriefed from the election saying that the model what their model wasn't wrong but it's kind of weird how they justify it um because a lot of the polls were clearly wrong but they give trump things like the incumbent advantage and things like that to offset the polls a little bit so they kind of said well we still gave him a chance and he did have a chance um so in in the end i think it was a pretty close race assuming that that what we know now is final um and confirmed and it, it, it swung towards Biden. Now, I'm really hesitant, and, and this is kind of something I always touch on when, when it comes to um, big events like this, of, of ascribing sweeping narratives to anything. So I, I, there's historically been an incumbent advantage. We know our country is very polarized. 
we know a lot of people hate Trump, but we also know a lot of people hate the left. So that's like, it's really just pe most people who voted voted because they hate the other party. Um, and then there are a lot of people who are overwhelmingly enthusiastic for Trump. So even if Trump's base is smaller, he might drive out Turner, uh, he might drive out voter turnout at a higher proportion. So I was kind of saying, there's all these factors. And there's also, as I talked to you about earlier, I heard this on the dispatch, they kind of did a breakdown about how about three, three percent of new mail in voters usually get their ballots thrown out because they usually fill out things incorrectly because they don't really know what they're doing. And um, a lot of people have trouble following relatively basic instructions because nobody really likes to read things. Um, and I, and, you know, I mean, we all do that all the time. Um, like, like, like if I got something in the mail and I have like three pages of boring text, I think I'm going to read it before I just flip to the filling in the bubbles. It's like I probably flipped to filling in the bubbles. And if you don't sign out at the right spot, you're about to get thrown out. So I thought because Democrats were going to overwhelmingly vote by mail, there was more of a chance that more percentage of their votes got thrown out. And that would also could could potentially offset in Trump's favor, especially in close states. So there was just so many variables that I, I thought it was kind of a toss up or predicting as kind of pointless unless you can quantify each of these things. That's kind of where I was at. And that's why I was. Um, Matt, Matt jokingly was kind of texting me saying things that he's like, oh, I was right all along this and that. And I was all upset because I didn't know he was joking. But it's not uncommon to see these pundits on TV essentially saying that Biden won. Therefore, every notion that Trump has ever stood for has been repudiated by voters. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, Joe Biden won a historic turnout. Um, 80 million people voted for Joe Biden. Therefore, uh, we have a mandate to push forward a policy agenda that is a uh, similar to what Joe Biden supports. And all these things are happening, even though it's like a very small amount of votes in several states are going to decide the election. But then it turns into that's the will of the people. So it's kind of funny to see how that's playing out, given, I guess, all the confounding factors. That uh, That's my overall observation about the actual election itself. Um, and I do think there's like not a negligible chance that a ton of like really bad things happened involving voter misconduct, um, mostly because I, I, I think that stuff could very easily happen. I think it happened in the past in like 2000 and 2004. Um, so I'm skeptical of it, but I think proving it in court is going to be impossible if anything did happen. And it's hard to get proof of those things that's verifiable, if even if something did happen. So chasing that dog is like a lost cause. So I, I find it very, very, very unlikely that anything will get overturned in the coming weeks. Um, so that's where I stand on, I guess, like 10 different aspects of the election. Um, so the interesting thing to me uh, so far about this election um, is I think that it was, it was a bit more of a toss up than perhaps I and many other people thought um, and just the fact that the race was so close um, illustrates that. I, I was pretty, I was leaning towards the idea that it would be a pretty, um, pretty solid victory, a pretty sweeping victory. Um, and then, if, of course, if you go by the popular vote, um, it was a pretty uh, comfortable victory by by Biden. Was it um, four? He, did he win by four million votes? Or I don't remember the exact number, but but something to that effect. Um, but in 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 even so, um, the victory was was by no means um, uh, by, by no means a situation where you know he just got pretty much all the votes and Trump got basically nothing. Um, it was like uh, it, it was a situation where it was about three or four percentage points away, uh, or three or four uh, three to four percentage points difference between the two. Um, and, and I, I think that was not something that I um, expected. Um, th that it shows that um, e even if people like myself, who pretty much despise the man we call Donald Trump, it shows that um, despite all his flaws or all the, the th all the reasons that I disagree with him or, or think he's a terrible president, there are still quite a few people out there that would. Um, get behind him at some level or say, well, I'd rather vote for him uh, than vote for Biden. Um, the, the, the thing that really, I guess, is surprising to me, or, or and this probably isn't as surprising to you as it is to me, um, 
the the polls the pollsters um, underestimated Trump for the second time. Now that they they got the last uh, in 2016 they got the the guess wrong for in terms of who won the presidential election. This time they did get the the their guess or their estimation was correct, but the numbers were way off. Um, p- people thought that Joe Biden was going to get way more electoral votes than he did. Um, pe- people thought, as, as I did, that it was going to be more of a sweeping victory than it was. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is a problem with with polling or pollsters. I don't know if this is a kind of a a, a cultural problem or or a a issue with um. Uh, certain kinds of attitudes or, or certain presuppositions or intuitions that people have that they aren't questioning. Um, but I, I think it, it is something we need to think about. Why, why does Trump overperform um, and, and why did Biden underperform? Um, and I, I think I have some thoughts on, in, in that regard and, and many people do as well. Um, but it, it's important to, to point it out in the first place. Um, it, it was not, uh, as I said, the, the election was closer than I thought it would be. Even if my general prediction was, cor- even if my prediction of who, of who would win the presidency was correct, it was a tighter race than I thought it would be. Um, and I realize, as you said, you don't like sweeping statements, but but I'm sure that there are things you could say about um the country right now as a whole, um, that, or you, you, you could make certain observations or certain general statements based on, um, how people voted in this election. Yeah. I, 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 I almost think there's not a lot to take away from the election as it stands. Um, like that there aren't, maybe because it was in a way so close, like if you look at the popular vote, the, it, it's going to be for, for a while, Democrats are always going to win. And a lot of that reason is because of how much they run up the numbers in California. But if you took away like California in 2016 altogether, if you took away for the, the, their votes, their, their votes for both candidates, then, then Trump would have won the popular vote in 2016. Um, and I, and I don't say that because like um, I, I, I don't say that because I think California should be ignored. I'm more saying that because I, w- I didn't know that at all. And I found that surprising when I found it out. Um, so it's like, I, I even when the, the popular vote is run up, a lot of that, if you just exclude California, it's like really close, <laughs> you know? So, and if you exclude California, which is like clearly uh, overwhelmingly like left wing in terms of the voters, at least, because a lot of Republicans there just don't bother voting because it's a solidly blue place, you end up with like a 50-50 country when it comes to it. And then a lot of re- regions from county to county are vastly polarized. So like I, I just am hesitant to make generalizations about like how America has shifted in any kind of tangible way when a lot of con- uh, a lot of counties just got like further blue or further red or some types of counties slightly changed but they only changed on the margin but the margin is enough to swing an election it's like okay so ten percent of people in one type of county all around the nation changed their mind so one out of ten people changed that's not a repudiation of America, right? That's one out of 10 people change their mind and that swings an election because elections are close. Um, but I, so, so, so that's why I'm hesitant to, to, to bring up narratives. Now, what you're saying about polling, I do agree that it's clearly wrong. I think it's actually a lot more wrong this year than it was in 2016, even though Trump lost. Because in 2016, a lot of the state polls were actually kind of, um, they, they were kind of accurate, right? So if you looked at the state polls, Trump was actually polling pretty well in all the states he ended up winning. Like he was still under polled, but not severely. Um, and then the national poll was actually right um, in 2016 because Hillary did win by a few points. So she was always projected by like four or five points up and she won the national vote by four or five points. Now, th- now th- this year was different in the sense that like people thought Mitch McConnell's race was going to be tight. And then he like blew out his challenger and it wasn't even close. And a ton of people donated to try to compete with Mitch McConnell. And then there was um, s- th- there were some other similar cases like with Lindsey Graham and then um, the, the, the Republican in, I think, Wisconsin was pulled down by like 16 points at one point and she held her the, 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 that Republican held her seat. So the state polling was really bad this year too. And that's different. And a lot of this can be seen as uh, Donald Trump has gone out there for four more years and openly 
fan the flames of we hate news reporters and the polls were wrong, which makes it more likely for no Republican to ever want to deal with pollsters. If a pollster called me, I'd probably like, I, I would not give them good information. Um, and if I, and I'm not a likely voter, but if I was going to vote, I'd, I'd vote for whatever the right wing party is. So like, I would never be counted. And a lot of what they do is generalized based on certain, uh, you know, characteristics of the person, like whether they went to college or not. But they're, they're finding that it's hard for them to count um, non-college educated blue collar white men. But the thing is, a lot of the non-college educated blue collar white men that answered their phone were Biden supporters to a higher proportion than actually turned out. So maybe the non-college educated blue collar white men that support Trump would never answer polls, but the ones that are left wing in that same demographic group would. So they get an incorrect skew of that population because only some of them will actually talk to pollsters and the others won't. So then you get wrong numbers. So I'm curious how 2024 is going to pan out, assuming Trump doesn't win in that Republican nomination in 2024. I'm assuming it's like a Nikki Haley. Imagine Nikki Haley versus Kamala Harris. I wonder how the polls would look versus the real results. But Donald Trump has definitely, you know, so discord there. And it's like, yeah, I don't blame him. I, I wouldn't want to work with people who t take results and then make generalizations about the world and what people believe based on, I guess, uh, certain people's, you know, groups or, or a small amount of evidence. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much more you want to talk about the election itself. Obviously, you can respond to that. But I do want to get to how, how we see things playing out once Biden's inaugurated. Yeah, well, I was going to say one more, like a, a few more things about the election. Then I was going to kind of uh, go into more about um, or kind of give the introduction or, or, or start the conversation about the where we're going from here. Um, and I'm going to do something that's potentially dangerous. I'm going to... Uh, kind of give, uh, give a give uh somewhat of a generalization uh which you might not like which is you can respond to or criticize if you like um but i, I think you i think a certain amount uh, a certain generalization is justified uh, in this sense um donald trump and joe biden um they, they represent um basically two um ways of functioning in the political arena, um, in a sense. So Joe Biden um, represents the uh, the status quo, um, just the traditional politician, you know, tries not to offend too many people, um, tries to appeal to, to both sides. Um, uh, he, he, he describes himself as a centrist, someone who can work with the Republican Party. Um, he... He, he's just your standard politician. Um, and then Donald Trump, now generally speaking, I would say most of his policies are pretty standard politician. But in terms of his rhetoric, in, in terms of his um, image, in terms of how he talks to people and how he engages with the world, he's a very atypical politician. Um, so I, I think this election, it, it's similar. Well, it's this election and the, the election 2016, they were really both about um do we want uh the standard pol the, do we want a uh a, a stereotypical politician or do we want um do we want someone who's uh anti who's who's against everything or, or do we want someone who conducts himself in such a way that is um against what a stereotypical politician stands for um and what i find fascinating is People only prefer uh, people only prefer these these um, the traditional politician, the stereotypical politician, slightly, ever so slightly. They, they, they preferred Joe Biden in the sense that he won, but they only preferred him just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, he, they preferred him to the point where to to get him into the White House, but they did not prefer him uh, overwhelmingly. It was not a sweeping victory, like I said. Um, and but but honestly, that that is the most fitting kind of victory for someone like Joe Biden, just just a middle of the road victory where um, in some ways you may not even call it a victory. And I know um, the uh, Crystal Ball and Sager and Jetty from the, the Rising, um, they put out a video that said that um, this election, even though uh, Trump won or Trump lost, excuse me, even though Trump lost, this was this election was a repudiation of the establishment. 
um, re repudiation of uh, uh, neoliberalism, um, a repudiation of the status quo, um, and uh, I think that's a, uh, I think that's a good way to uh, look at it. Um, but uh, would you like me to go into sort of where I see Joe Biden? Going from here, would you like to respond to some of that first? Yeah, I, I just have a couple quick thoughts. Um, one, one is, I, I've heard that narrative. I'm okay, I'm not like it, the, one of the problems with those narratives is it's kind of like um how every day that the stock market either goes up or down, right? And every day that there are endless amounts of news that could affect stock prices. So you go on Bloomberg.com, and on Bloomberg.com there, there there there's a headline, and it says Dow goes down after news of and then it's like a statement from the federal reserve in some random interview that could was potentially benign so it's like they, 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 they've associated two things and it's a narrative that makes sense but really there's no way to show causal link it just makes sense it seems like a fitting narrative so they put it up there and nobody really questions it that's kind of how i feel about that narrative like i'm like yeah it's plausible but it's also plausible that america is like super polarized and really, anybody who is seen as a Democrat versus anybody who seems like uh, anti-Democrat is going to be close to a 50-50 split um, or a 45-49 split. I think that's kind of how I might see it. But I'm not like against that argument. I think it's a fair case. I think that's why Donald Trump won the primaries. I don't know if I'd expand that to the, to the general. Or I'd use it to, to explain some of his support. But then I'd be like, but what made Donald Trump competitive is he's not a Democrat. And a lot of people hate Democrats. So, I mean, but, but either way, we're, we're generalizing and it's kind of hard to prove and there's a lot of factors at play, right? So that's why I'm just hesitant. Um, so, so, so I'm less saying you're wrong. I'm more saying I'm just skeptical of any narrative. And I would say that's a fine one. I'd put it in the box of potential ones. Um, now, now with the, the Sager and crystal, crystal Ball thing, I think that's funny when, um, when, 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 when all these statements come out about like how we should interpret it, like, oh, this is a repudiation of neoliberalism. It's like so many people who voted probably don't does, don't know what neoliberalism means. If you ask them, it's like people don't understand most policies. And a lot of people who think they understand policies are because they watch a little bit of cable news every day. Right. Like, like, like the average voter who feels informed is like so uninformed on policies and they probably can't give a steel man description of their opponent's policies position. So it's so funny that we interpret election results as like vast repudiations of an ideology that most voters probably can't even explain in like a two sentence answer. I just think that's funny. I mean, it's kind of true if you say, well, when I say they repudiated neoliberalism, I mean, it's workers who don't want to lose their jobs. And by the voters, I mean only voters in the swing states because they're the ones who swing the elections. Then it's like, OK, that's fair. But it's like, do you think like that many like 19 year olds in California know what neoliberalism means? It's like, no, because they're all going to be freshmen in, in college and they just got a basic civics educated education and they all voted for Joe Biden and they don't know the difference between neoliberalism and like a lot of populist stuff. It's like only a few people will. Most people will have a slight interest phase and then kind of phase out. So it's just like, I don't know. When I hear that stuff from pundits, I kind of cringe. That's all I want way, to say. I think a better way maybe to put it um, would be, and I actually didn't watch that video, by the way. I'm going solely on the title of that video, so I don't quite know what those two said in that video. But um, maybe a better way to put it would be um, people are, I mean, I, people are pretty, or the, the average person, let's say, um, generally speaking, um, is pretty discontent with the way things are. Um, that there are various reasons for that, and you can have make various arguments for how we should tweak the system to to make it um, more inclusive or or, or more um, effective or or more free, <laughs> um, d depending on on what your priorities are. Um, but um, and this this was also true for 2016. But uh, as far as I know, the situation really hasn't improved. As you say, the the country is very polarized. Um, people's basic worldviews are, are in conflict, really. The the worldview of a Trump supporter and a Biden supporter. I mean, there, there's obviously, there is overlap, but but uh, on, a, on many key issues, um, they're, they're diametrically opposed. Um, so the, the average person doesn't even necessarily need to know, like, the definition of neoliberalism to say, well, whatever this system is, I don't like it, and so I'm going to vote in such a way 
as to try to um, to fight the system or try to get uh, change the system um, in in a way that that I uh, see as as the way I, the way I see that they, they vote to change the system um, in the direction that, that that they want to see it go. Um, yeah, I, I agree with all that. I agree with that. Alrighty. Um, sh- shall I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Picture. Let me paint a picture then of where I see uh, the country going in the next couple years, um, and it's quite interesting. So I was having a conversation with a um, with a guy um, about Joe Biden, um, and I-, I was bringing up. Okay, so so uh, Bernie Sanders in in an interview with. Um, uh, the PBS news. Um, he said something that I thought was particularly stupid. Um, he said, uh, Joe Biden will be the most progressive president since FDR. Um, and the, the, the guy I was talking to, he said, no, Matthew, that's a perfectly legitimate statement. These things are all relative. If Joe Biden, um, gets us uh, sing, uh, gets us a public option that would be the most progressive piece of legislation since uh, FDR. Um, I, I, I bring that up as, as a springboard to just the conversation of like, well, what kind of president will Joe Biden be? Um, and, and that is a question that, you know, a lot of leftists, well, everyone's been having, but especially in, in leftist circles, because of course, that goes back to the question of, well, do you vote for Joe Biden or do you not vote for Joe Biden? Um, I was one of the people that did not vote for Joe Biden, but I knew a lot of leftists, left-leaning people that did vote for Joe Biden, and I respect their decision in that regard. Um, but I really do not see, I, I do not see uh, Joe Biden being the kind of person or the kind of politician who will make any sweeping changes to the status quo, um, he will continue. It, it will basically be um, like another four years of Obama. Now, of course, Obama and Biden aren't exactly the same. They differ on policies uh, here and there, um, but generally their their worldview is the same. So it's it's going to be like uh, uh, another four years of Obama or another four years of maybe uh, Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter or, or any like establishment Democrat you, you can name. Um, it's just going to be four more years of that. Um, now will, will, will the left, um, push Joe Biden in a more progressive direction? Um, I'm very doubtful. I'm very skeptical. It's possible. I hope it, I hope we can make Joe Biden more progressive or we can push him to, uh, enact progressive policies. Um, but I, I really just don't. Based on his based on his uh, voting record, um, I don't see him moving in a very progressive direction. I don't even see um, now. Someone might say, "Well, Matthew uh, Kamala Harris is more progressive than Biden, and she's going to push him in a greater or in a in a more progressive direction." Um, and I, I just I think these are um, sort of wishful fantasies that many on the left are telling themselves. Like, okay, we got rid of Trump. And now we have a Democrat in the White House, and this Democrat is really going to um, change things. He, he's really going to push the country in the right direction. Um, again, I don't see that as happening. I, I think um, ba- basically the, the difference between a, Do- a Donald Trump and a Joe Biden is um, the speed at which they're driving the car towards the cliff. <laughs> that, that's, that's This is the... the uh, the metaphor that I, that I came up with. Um, I think they're, they're both driving us towards a precipice, but Joe Biden is just driving us towards a precipice uh, s- more slowly. Um, am I, I'm glad, or I'm re- I am relieved to be rid of the orange man, um, but I'm, I am disappointed that um, a centrist neoliberal is in the White House because, again, I just don't see the changes that I want to see made, uh, getting done. Um, I think that's a good, I, I think I'll let you jump in here. So, 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 so the, the most glaring, I guess, issue with, with, with what you said for me is that no point did you talk about the, the relationship between the legislative branch and the executive. 
in the sense that you didn't factor that into what you think Joe Biden will do. And I think that is by far the most decisive factor. So say we had gotten the blowout situation where you actually have a majority of Democrats in the House and the Senate and then Biden's president. Well, then I think somebody could argue that Joe Biden would do things to give you guys the single payer health care you want. You would still be skeptical. And we had that conversation a few months ago when we had a discussion about why I don't think Bernie and Biden are that different, because I think that whatever the legislature gets them, they'll both sign. Right. So I didn't think Biden would be as vocal about it, but I think Biden would pretty much sign whatever progressive legislation got in front of him. That's why I think the Biden presidency, especially for the 20, 2020 through 2022 section, well, 2021 through 2022, um, is going to be purely based on the fact that they don't have a Democratic majority in the Senate. So any legislation that is remotely polarizing isn't going to get through both the House and the Senate, so it will never make it to Biden's desk in the first place. Um, then what it comes down to is how the 2022 midterms go. Um, and because of that, I pretty much see there being gridlock through the first term of Biden's presidency, because normally the presidents lose in the midterms. Um, so I, I less think it has to do with Biden's ideology, and I think it more has to do with the circumstances that the election has brought him. And I think that is the pivotal, the pivotal factor that's determining everything here, because there's no way Sanders could get through burn, th through single payer if he had this outcome, because the, the Republicans in the Senate aren't going to get, get it past the Senate, right? And the Democrats don't have control of it, so they wouldn't even be able to get it to Bernie's desk to sign. So I don't, th I don't think that really matters at this point. I, it could arguably have mattered if it was a blowout, but it's not going to now. So now what it comes down to is what things are by is Biden willing to do as an ex as an executive order. Um, I think that comes down to predictions about what's going to happen with Biden and if he's going to actually last four years or if Kamala Harris will step in. Because if they're planning on doing Kamala Harris as the Democratic you know, um, nominee in 2024, then maybe they're going to pass a lot of kind of grandstanding executive orders rolling back inconsequential Trump policies that weren't even really enforced, but they do it to kind of grandstand that they did all these things and rolled all these things back. And I would, I'm not going to really care in the sense that they probably weren't important or impactful. They're much smaller in terms of their their scope, um, but they'll, they'll be used to keep culture wars inflamed and to keep division there. And that's going to play a factor in whatever the 2022 and 2024 elections are. That That's how I see it. So I, I less care about Biden's character because it doesn't matter because he's not going to get progressive legislation put in front of him. Um, maybe, maybe Tulsi or Bernie would have pulled back people from wars and you do still have a centrist neoliberal who's going to keep people in you know, the Middle East. But th that's like the main distinction, I guess, fr from what I'm seeing. I don't, I don't think I'm off base to see it that way. Um, OK, so I was minimizing or I was not um, speaking about the uh, the legislature in, in um, my opening remarks um, for a very specific reason. Um, Am I saying that uh, obstruction is not a factor? No, of course not. Um, I, I would say um, I would say there was obstruction under Obama, um, and uh, and and it was uh, the Republicans obstructing Obama from doing various things, um, and it was shameful and ridiculous. And uh, um, I'm I'm not going to um, uh, so. I guess what I'm trying to say is um, th there is th there's plenty of blame to go around and the Republicans are um, there's a lot of blame to lay on the Republicans. But I, I didn't bring up the legislator because uh, um, the legislature because uh, the Democrats are just so bad at playing politics. Um, the the party is basically a farce at this point. They. Um, and this gets back to, as you say, the discussion we had about is there a difference between a Bernie Sanders and a Joe Biden? Um, because uh, the Democrats could get a lot more done if they knew how to play politics, if they were ruthless, if they um, actually had a spine, um, but they don't. They don't have a spine. Um, they are... Uh, they, they, they truly um, go along to get along, um, and m most Democrats, um, they, they don't have a, 
they're not willing to fight for their principles. Um, they, they, they let the, the, the it, it's, it's as if um, the Democrats are um, a dog and the Republicans are the owner and the Republicans consistently kick the dog and the dog just takes it. I'm sorry, master. I'm sorry, master. I'll, I'll, I'll try to behave. <laughs> um, as, as I might've said this before, but it, it's, we, ha we basically have a one party system. Um, the, the, uh, and it's, uh, it's, um, the Republicans and Democrats, they differ a little bit here and there, at least on social issues. Um, but they mostly agree on, um, the general worldview. And when they disagree, the Democrats consistently, um, uh, give up and let the Republicans run all over them. Um, and, uh, that, really is one of my biggest issues with the Democratic Party and, and one of the reasons why I'm very, uh, I, I am not um, uh, holding my breath. I, I'm not expecting Joe Biden, I'm not expecting much out of Joe Biden for that very reason. Okay, so there, there, there's two things there, but one of them I'm just going to not touch because uh, that's too far of a hole to dig into now now what i'm going to say is um, it's i'm mostly going to respond to the first thing what you said which is like about obstruction under obama now when you have like so, so somebody could argue that the democrat house has been obstructionist for the last uh you know two years since the midterms because they took the house and the democrats don't want to forward republican policies so pretty much obama had Every, he had the legislative and the executive for his first two years, and then he lost it. He didn't do much in his first two years, so then except for uh, get Obamacare through. So then after that, Republicans were in power. If your party was in power in the legislative branch and your opposition was in, if the opposition was in power in the executive branch, you wouldn't pass the legislation you know that's going to get signed into law you don't like. Now that that has been construed as obstruction when it's just oh, I'm a Republican that doesn't like this Democrat policy, so I'm not going to let it go through with 50 votes because I don't want it passed. That, that's pretty much what they did for six years of, under Obama. And to some extent, I'm okay with that because it keeps big programs from not you know, coming into existence. But it's just kind of like, it's, it, it's exactly what um, Democrats have done for the last two years when there was the blue wave in, 20, uh, in 2018. Right. So it's like now you have a blue house. It's like, obviously, they're not going to pass anything the Republicans in the Senate want. So the Republicans in the Senate are only going to do things that only the Senate has a jurisdiction over. So they put forward a bunch of federal judges because that's what the Senate does. They, 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 they didn't rely on the House to do anything. It doesn't have anything to do with ruthless politics. All it comes down to is here. Here's what well, ruthless politics can dictate an election. Right. So if the if Democrats were more ruthless and voters like that. Then if, if there was 52 Democrats in, in the Senate right now, then you're right. Then, you know, there'd be something for Biden to work with. But even if Bernie was president and all the Democrats turned their A game on and they're like, we're going to do everything in the book to get this passed. The Republicans go, no, there's 50 of us. There's 50 of us and you can't or, or there's 51 of us. So you cannot get this through the Senate. So you can't get it through. Um, so it's just like I understand what you're saying. And I I mean, I only disagree on the margins, but it's like. Given where we are, it wouldn't matter how cutthroat they are because Republicans essentially have a veto. Um, and it's not like there are ways to work around it. The, arguably, that they could get rid of um, the – if Democrats got a slim majority in the Senate, they would be able to get they, – they, they, they could break down the legislative um, – God, what, what, what is the thing I'm thinking of? Um, when, when people uh, – I, I, I can't come up with the, with the word for it right now. Um, but, but essentially, you know how you need 50, you need 60 votes to bring a piece of legislation through. So 40 can block it. Um, the, the Democrats essentially said they, they'd knock down that rule if they got a majority, but they don't even have a majority. So it doesn't even matter, no matter how ruthless they were or if they were willing to break down institutional rules, they still couldn't get anything passed with, with 51 Republicans there. And that's what it's looking like the situation is right now. So in the end, I just don't think that's relevant to the 2021, 2022 Biden cycle, if we're looking at it narrowly. Um, I mean, you, you could argue the reason Trump got in is because he seemed like a ruthless person who was going to do everything he could to fight for the people. Um, and that, that, that won him the presidency. That could, that could be argued. So Democrats could do better if they portrayed that image and were more cutthroat. But given the actual election results, it doesn't matter how they play it. It's just they, they have a veto. 
So if Bernie was president with the same amount of people in the House and Senate, it wouldn't matter. It's just not getting to him. I think I mostly agree with your statement and exactly or, or completely disagree with the very last statement you just made. Um, but I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit hole. Well, exactly. I, I think we might want to, because if you somehow think if there are 51 Republicans in the, in the Senate, Bernie would still be able to get single single payer through, then you need to open my mind to that, because I just don't know how he'd get 51 Republicans and he'd get Republicans to jump on board with progressive agenda. It's just like, no. You, you can't, even if you broke out rules that like Biden would generally leave instilled, it's like you can't get that past them. I mean, well, let me make sure I, I, I we could be quibbling over words here. So um, that's why I'm not sure the rabbit hole is worth going down. But but I'll just maybe I'll try to rephrase what I'm saying or, or put it. Uh, I'll try to put it a bit differently. Um, I think that. That there is a way to play politics, um, even even if you're the minority, uh, um, in which you get uh, a heck of a lot done, and you can get um, key parts of your um, legislative agenda um, done. Uh, but 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 again, you have to know how to play politics, and I I just don't think most members, uh, m most uh, Democratic politicians know how to play politics the the republicans they know how to play politics it doesn't matter uh if they um well let, let me put it to you like this um so under obama um for, for part of uh for part of obama's presidency of course the, the the democrats were um the majority that wasn't true for his entire presidency of course but um even with a Democrat in the White House, I would say that the Republicans basically got out of him what they wanted, and they um, consistently um, uh, they consistently blocked or prevented him from doing anything that strayed from their basic agenda. Um, and, and again, this this might just be a, a difference in our intuitions, but I truly see the Republican Party as the most influential party in this country. The Democratic Party is a wing of the Republican Party. Again, that's not to say there are no differences between the parties, but um, the the Republican Party is the dominant party because be, be, because they um, are single minded about what they want, um, and the the Democrats just aren't single minded in that what, way. What is the one thing they're single minded that they want, though? Because if they're one issue, one mind, what what, what is their principle? Oh, I, I just mean they are they're single minded in the sense that they will it's like a they, high mind, they, okay. they continuously fight for their um uh, their agenda um no matter what and they, they never stray from that um agenda. Um the the Democrats um consistently back down. Um if, if they can if the Republicans can smear anything as socialist, the Democrats back down. Joe Biden has said multiple times he is against uh, a single payer um, healthcare system. If a single payer healthcare system got on his desk, he said, he would veto it. Um, and I, I, I cannot help but believe that or think that um, part of that has to do with the um, how much the Republican Party has influenced um, American politics. It, it's gotten to the point where it's it, a. a, a um, it's gotten to the point where a single payer healthcare system is a smear um, rather than um, a policy which um, the majority of Americans um, want. Um, it's gotten to the point where you can, you can take what the majority of Americans want and you can say, that's evil, that's bad, that's wrong, that's socialism. Um, if we do that, then we're going to be the next Soviet Union. <laughs> um, Am I making myself any clearer? I, I don't expect yeah, yeah. you to so, agree, but, but so, I want to. Um, I, I would love to transcribe your monologue there and then do a whole episode where I like highlight and circle certain things and say, okay, you said this sentence. Here's how I interpret it. Here's why I think it's wrong. Now, the, 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 I, I think the reason why I is um, I was actually commenting on the different part of your lecture, though, uh, in, in the beginning, in the first part, where I was kind of saying, okay, 
I'm not going to touch the whole thing about playing politics as much as I can. I'm just going to talk about the fact that if, if, if a party doesn't like legislation and they control Congress, then that party will inha- inevitably block that legislation so it won't get to the desk. And especially if it's big legislation, we, we know from 2010 through 2016, no big liberal stuff got through the, the, the got, got through the Senate. So obviously, even if Bernie was in the same situation, if he wanted to put forward something, he'd just be Obama from 2014, given that even Obama in 2014, who was overwhelmingly popular and the Congress was overwhelmingly unpopular, couldn't get anything through. Now, it, if we want to, so, so the stuff you were touching on is stuff that I have opinions on. That's just like another hour and a half episode. And it's, and it's less of disagreeing with you and more of um, going back to the very first conversation today and talking about sweeping narratives and a lot of funny observations I have that are rel- relevant to your observation. Um, and it's just things I've noticed. Um, and then we, we would go down those rabbit holes. Um, I, I guess I was trying to make a precise point. Um, and I, I don't want to talk about the parties and how they relate and how disgusting they are because I think that's just another box that we don't have time to unpack unless we're doing a two hour episode, which we're not. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think we'll table that for at least the short term. Um, yeah. Now the one thing I did want to say before we, before we do wrap up is the, 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 the result of Biden winning with, with a house that's Democrat and a Senate that is Republican is to some extent, the best outcome possible for me um because what normally happens when there's a democrat president is republicans pretend to be tea partiers and then they care more about fiscal responsibility and they fight over every dollar in the budget so biden does not get the honeymoon phase where he can just like obama did have two years to cram through things that he likes that are big government before the uprising happens and i i foresee if the republicans don't lose their 22 their 2022 majority in the Senate, that we're going to have four years of a stalemate. And although there will still be omnibus budgets that proliferate spending to some extent, it's not going to be huge programs. And that was the uh, world I expected with Biden winning or any Democrat having control of both the presidency and um, the legislative branch. So because of this, I think this is also, um, if Trump had won with the Republican Senate, then I think we'd have bigger spending than with Biden winning with Republican Senate because now the Republicans have to cosplay as libertarians um, because they have to pretend to be responsible now um, in order to uh, be adversarial to Biden. So I think this actually, if you look at like the matrix of the four results, this this quarter is the lowest spending option. And I think that's best. So I'm okay with that to some extent as a person who didn't vote and is just observing it. Obviously, it doesn't roll back government at all, but I guess it'll probably slower the pace than any other option. So that, that's my libertarian or anarchy oriented or small government oriented uh, optimism, I guess, with the result. Although I do expect like a lot of executive orders that are, I guess, big government in the sense that they'll be bringing back regulations. So that uh, that's my official 2021, 2022 outlook. If you want to give a quick, um, I guess... Uh, I'll wrap up on that before we sign off for the episode. I think I've basically given my overview of what I think Biden's going to give, but but I can say a little more um, before, as you say, before we wrap up. Um, I am I'm fairly pessimistic, I guess you could say. Um, I think best case scenario, um, Joe Biden puts forth. Um, a few um, progressive, um, uh, a few pieces of progressive legislation um, that he somehow uh, that 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 they that the Democrats managed to get through, um, and then the rest of it is just going to be business as usual. It's going to be nothing special. Um, Joe Biden will go in the history books as oh okay, what one of those just regular old presidents, nothing too crazy, um, but. You know, nothing great, nothing awful necessarily. Um, just a, a middle of the road um, kind of president. Um, I will, b- because I consider myself to be of the left, I will be um, very critical of Joe Biden um, in in many specific ways. I'll, I'll give him credit where credit is due. Um, I, I don't. I'm not one of those people. So some people on the left, they would say, okay, Trump and Biden. Um, they're basically the same. There's no difference at all. Um, 
And it's like, okay, maybe at the at a bigger pic at, at, at a big picture level, you could say I could see where someone might say that. But but um, when you get down to the spe- down to the specifics, that there are definitely differences. There are definitely there are definitely differences. So you know, you take um, the Iran or, or the situation with Iran. Um, our relations with Iran will be far better under a Joe Biden presidency than they ever would have been under a Trump presidency. Um, Joe, uh, and, and there, there are other examples where I would say Joe Biden is far preferable to um, uh, to Donald Trump. He will, he will at least, if he doesn't try to pass a, a public option, he will at least maintain Obamacare, which, for all its flaws, was better than what previously, or uh, what, what the it, it was a better, it's a better healthcare system than what, than we had previously. Um, he, he will try to preserve certain gains that Obama made. Um, Obama was not a completely worthless president. <laughs> um, do, do, do you think Joe Biden will... Um, okay, he, he, here's the last question. It's a fun bonus question. Um, do you think before the end of 20... But, 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 okay, do you think before the 2024 presidential election, Kamala Harris will become president? Oh, um, it's a fun bonus. That's a doozy of a question. Yeah, Um, that's why it's a bonus one. You don't have to think about that hard. You just got to tell me your intuition. My intuition. Uh, I mean, I I don't really feel comfortable giving much of a uh, giving a a prediction on that. Um, oh, I think everybody does it. Come on. I I think Joe Biden can probably make it four years. I don't think he can make it much more. Um. Is it possible that he could step down and Kamala could take control? Yes, it's possible. Um, I guess so. My intuition, I guess, says he will probably out, uh, make it four years and then step. But maybe at that point, then he would step down and Kamala Harris would run in his place. Um, but but I I don't feel like I know enough to to say one way or the other. Um, it, we could end up having President Kamala Harris, um, which would. Um, which again would would not uh, I would not be. Um, uh, jumping up and down, I would not be doing cartwheels if we get President Kamala Harris. Just like I'm not doing cartwheels after we've got or we've got President Elect uh, Joe Biden. Well, um, and Kamala Harris does not um, inspire me <laughs> any more than Joe Biden does. I, I, I will say I I'm going to take this deeply cynical take, and I'll say that either Biden's going to step down after a year because they want Kamala Harris president as they aim for the 2022 uh, mid- midterms or he'll step down after the 2022 midterms because they thought that making her president earlier would actually hurt the Democrats. That That's the cynical take. I don't think I'll die, but I think I'll step down. Um, I'm, I'm going to lock in that answer. Um, okay. Well, I'm glad we have to chat about the election and our takeaways and also how we see things going. And we got to talk a little bit about more um, abstract things that are related to that. Um, and I think we, we have a lot of stuff we, we need to cover because there's just so much stuff that we like to argue about. Um, <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed the, 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 this uh, somewhat debrief. Um, it's to some extent it's kind of late because the election happened weeks ago, but it's not really over still. So I guess it's, it's pretty timely. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed this commentary. Uh, you could find me on Twitter. I think I actually changed my Twitter handle since last time we recorded. I think it's Matthew T. Keck, at Matthew T. Keck. I think that's how you can find me on Twitter. Um, and there, there, I just say things that are very anarchist oriented every now and then. And like Tom Woods posts, that's pretty much it. Um, and you can find us on YouTube to watch the video version of this podcast by searching the anti-philosopher and beyond talking points. Um, and then you can see how uh, I rate both of us get when we're muted and the other person is monologuing about our uh, f- philosophical ideals. And we're, and we're just pontificating for minutes and minutes as the other person gets more upset. We, we, we tend to do that. Um, and yeah, and feel free to peruse the backlog. We have a lot of episodes that um, are still relevant and they're going to be evergreen because like we, we talked about John Zerzan recently and, and uh, anarcho-primitivism. And that's just a fun thing to talk about. And like that, that's always going to be relevant because it's not like uh, Ted Kaczynski. Well, well, it was a recent uh, event. So anarcho-primitivism is always something you can kind of revisit. Um, so yeah, hope you guys check out some of that stuff and I hope you enjoyed. And signing off, Matt and Matt.